unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. The Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter from the 12th verse. The Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter from the 12th verse. It speaks of a certain noble man. This is Jesus giving a story of a certain noble man who went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. But before he goes, the Bible says he summons ten of his servants, ten, and he delivers unto them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And if we will uh, skip because of time, of course, he goes, does whatever he's led to do, and he returns having received that kingdom in verses 15. And then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Okay? And then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound has gained ten pounds. And they say to that man, well, thou good servant, because thou has been faithful in very little, thou hast authority over ten cities. Authority over ten cities. And I want you to underline that. And the second came saying, Lord, Thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he says, likewise, you're also a good fellow. I've given you over five cities. Another came saying, Lord, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in the napkin, for I fear thee, because thou art an austere man, and thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, out of thine mouth, your own mouth, have you judged yourself, you wicked servant? For if you knew that I was an austere man, who was taking up that which I laid not down or reaps where I did not sow, you would have taken my money into the bank that uh, at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, the other guy has ten pounds. And he says, for I say unto you that everyone which has shall be given and from him that has not even that which he has shall be taken away from him. I want to define for you one of the most revealing experiences concerning the law of inheritance. Inheritance is a law that has been given by God. In human history, from the beginning of time, we have seen inheritances that are passed on from fathers to sons, generation upon generation. And so when we go into the New Testament, the law of inheritance is redefined because when we believe Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Bible says that we become sons of God. And of course, by the laws of inheritance, there are many rules that govern the law of inheritance. And one of which, for example, is that inheritances are passed on to children, sons. And if no sons, daughters. These are all fundamental rules concerning the law of inheritance, and it's all given in the Old Testament. But also, most importantly, there is a governing rule that a servant can take of an inheritance if he behaves as a son to the master. It's the only allowance that is given in Scripture. So it's not given, actually, to servants to take of inheritance, except if they appear and act and submit themselves as sons in that household, they are allowed in special instances, but not always. You see, for example, you know the story of our father Abraham, how at the point of his maturation, he has no child to take over what he has made. And he has made up in his mind that if I should uh, die, Eliezer, my servant, can take over this responsibility. Why? Because Eliezer had served Abraham even as a son. And Abraham had a relationship with Eliezer. You see? When Sarah could not conceive child, she asked Abraham to go into one of her handmaids, which was Hagar. 
she just didn't choose from among her handmaids. She had to choose one which was most submitted, the most loyal. And that's why she chose. Unfortunately, Hagar later on at the point of conception changed. But by and large, we see that inheritances are only transferred to servants based on unique circumstances. And it's due to their service, their heart, and commitment to their masters. But when it comes to children, it's automatic. It's easily and it's allowed by all law and principles, spiritually and physical, to pass over inheritance to children. And because of that, when we become born again, when we enter the kingdom of God, we come in as sons and daughters. And so we don't fight for inheritance. We don't try to go into seeking after inheritance. It is given us, the Bible says, that we've been born to an inheritance, imperishable, and defiled, incorruptible. So our inheritance is available. We've begotten into an inheritance. It's reserved. It's given. It's yours for the taking. The Bible speaks of how the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the inheritance with which we have in God. So when you become born again, you have an inheritance. You're blessed with an inheritance. You're given all that will pertain to life and godliness. You are taken care of because God has provided for you as a son. These are not things you're even supposed to ask for. These are things you should learn how to receive if you know how God thinks and how God relates to humanity. So it's not things that you struggle with in your spirit. You say, oh, you know, and then you live a life of salvation where you are planning this and planning that and you're taking shortcuts, you know, to get into the will and purposes of God. You're using human efforts, you know, to attain, you know, the blessing of God. Many of your acts of service and commitment toward God are contrived because they have very many ulterior motives in your seeking. And, and before you know that, it becomes so carnal, and yet you appear to be spiritual. And then, you know, the longer you live, the more frustrated you become because you don't know how to connect to the things that are available for you. Unfortunately, for some in the church, then they give heed to false doctrines about why they're not successful, about why this is not available for them. Your prayer is warped. It's all wrong because you're taught the wrong way. And then you live a life of failure upon failure, mischief upon mischief. You know, the spiral is going downward and you're losing and losing every day. And the older you grow, the more you realize that certain things are not going to be able to catch up with you. And then you consume the gospel as a drug to comfort you in the spaces where you don't have answers for. That's not the place of the gospel. The gospel is not just there to, you know, provide for your complacency. It's not there to feed your inefficiency. It's not there to comfort you in your spaces where you are low but also keep you low you understand the gospel is called to not only comfort you in your times of testation but to comfort you out of your times of testation that's the responsibility of the gospel of jesus christ so now the truth is here god has given us a simple example that i pray by god i'll expound for your understanding in luke 19 the story is given this uh, wonderful man lives 10 pounds to his own to 10 of his servants, and he gives them the instruction, occupy until I come. Occupy until I come. If you read the original translation, the Greek word there for occupy it means tread until I come. Transact with this until I come. Find ways of developing and growing what I've given you until I come. And so, of course, in return, one has multiplied it fully, and he has gained 10 pounds more out of the 10 pounds he received. Another one has gained 5 pounds out of the 10 pounds he received. Another one hid it because he feared the master. Uh, long and short, the man which is faithful and brings back 10 pounds, the Bible says God gives him authority over 10 cities. And the man which is faithful and brings back 5, God gives him also authority over 5 cities. And even the talents or the giftings or the graces or the pounds or the provisions of the man that has done nothing with what God has given him. The Bible says they're taken from him and they're given the man that has performed the most. Even that which he had, the little, because he did not know how to occupy with it, the Bible says was taken away from him and given to the man who knew how to multiply what is given. Here is the mystery. You cannot prove what you cannot translate. You cannot manifest 
what you cannot translate. You cannot demonstrate what you cannot translate. You cannot multiply what you cannot translate. The power in the law of inheritance is the translation of things. It's the translation of things. Because things are available for you. It's one thing for you to know, oh, you know, God has provided for me concerning all that I'll ever need financially in the world. It's true. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For though he was rich, but bade he himself to be poor, that for your sex, through his poverty, you might become rich. Yes, wealth is available for you as a child of God. But you must know how to translate what is given to you by God to the power to manifest and show it and reveal it to the world so it will benefit you even in this world of men. It's what the man says that he believes to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You cannot see that goodness if you have not learned the power to translate. What do I mean by the power to translate? I'm talking about the ability to be able to tread T-R-A-D-E, to take advantage of what is given to you, to grow what is given to you, to tend what is given to you, to germinate what is given to you. Whatever you have as a blessing before God comes in the form of a seed. For example, if you are a farmer, you understand what I mean. But if you cannot be able to germinate that seed to germinate that seed then it doesn't matter whether you have that seed or the best seed in the world you're not going to eat food you see what I'm saying so the wisdom to be able to germinate that seed is what I call translating the power to be able to germinate that seed that power is the translation that's why I say that you cannot germinate or grow, manifest or show forth what you cannot translate. The wisdom that is necessary to know what is needed to provide all that is necessary for this particular seed to receive the life of germination, to undergo the process of germination. But the Bible says he giveth seed to the sower. To the sower first comes seed. So everything you've received in God spiritually comes in seed form. But to be able to translate that seed into a plant and fruit that would feed, benefit you, and define you in the spaces of reward, that is what I came to talk about. I want to show you the power of translation to manifest, to reveal, to prove, to demonstrate what God has given you. By God in Christ Jesus. Because all of these things are available. He says whether Paul or Apollos. Whether things present or things to come. He says all things are yours. And you are Christ. And Christ is God's. So if all of these things are yours. Why is it that you have failed to manifest. Or show forth these things in the realm of men. In the world that is seen. The physical realm. And that is what I want to emphasize on. And press my time on today. Ecclesiastes 6. One speaks of an evil disease. That is common among men. The Bible says. God says he gives a man riches. He gives him wealth and great honor that he wanteth nothing for his soul for all that he will ever desire. So riches are available. Wealth is available. Honor is available. Honor is available. I emphasize that. And anything else a man will ever desire has been given by God. But the Bible says, but that man has not the power to eat thereof. Or in the versions we read, sometimes we say, and God giveth not the power to eat thereof. It doesn't mean that God is the one who has withdrawn. But the Bible says, but God does not participate in availing the power. Why? Because it is in the man to know how to churn that power. You see? it. So the man carries no space of connecting and God will not aid that man anywhere because he knows that this is the part of man to know how to build that power to translate these things. But because that man cannot translate these things, the Bible says a stranger comes and eateth these things. A stranger comes and eateth these things. And God calls that vanity. And he says it is an evil disease. Some people are not struggling from cough and flu. They're not suffering from COVID and cancer. They're suffering from this kind of disease. They do not know how to connect to the power 
power that translates the things that have been given to them into the manifestation, the showing forth, the proving, the demonstration of these things that it might benefit them as individuals. And so they live a life of continuous hope in God and some have actually lost their hope over time because they've tried and they just don't seem to get answers. God says that that is an evil disease. It is a breach of spirit. It is a reproach on a man's identity and destiny. The Bible speaks in Lamentations, the fifth chapter. The Bible speaks of how the men are weeping and says, God, remember, O Lord, what has come upon us and consider and behold our reproach. And what was the reproach? In verse 2, our inheritance is turned to strangers and our houses to aliens or foreigners. Their inheritance is turned to strangers. And he says, and their houses are now to foreigners. I wish some people knew what is already given and is available, and it is theirs, but it is in the hands of other people. It is in the hands of other people. The Bible says in Galatians that when a child is young, he differeth not from a servant. He's not any different from a servant. So yes, that child has an inheritance that is available, it is given and left for them. But the Bible says because he is a servant, he is Lord of all, his place of lordship is because of the inheritance given. But because he is a child, the Bible says that child is put under tutors, under governors, until the time that is appointed of the father. So if a man back in the day had a disease and he was going to die, he would say, you know, for example, he had great wealth, riches, or he had come to an end of life, he would say, you know, this, my child, should be heir. But he doesn't know how to control my finances. He doesn't know how to run my estate. He doesn't know how to deal in my business. And so, if I am going to die, then this is what you will leave uh, to these governors. I'm going to appoint governors and tutors, people that are going to be in charge, regiments to be in charge of that child's wealth. When this child becomes 18 or 24, 25, that child's wealth will be passed over. So it's in the responsibility of governors and tutors or regiments to make sure that they keep treading these things, keeping, preserving, giving them life and multiplying this wealth until the time appointed for that child to take over that inheritance. And God says, it is because you are a babe. The Greek word there is nepios, a spiritual babe. You are unable to discern and connect with the things of the Spirit and the ways of God and His dealings concerning their inheritance. That is already available for you. There is nothing you need that is not available in God. Nothing. There is nothing you have dreamed of, desired in God that is not available now. But God wants that maturation. He wants you to grow in wisdom. He wants you to grow in stature. He wants you to grow in understanding. He wants you to grow in favor. He wants you to understand how the world works. He wants you to build enough tenacity. He wants you to star your potential. He wants to align your potency to what is available for you to grow and what you are able to grow. Then he expands these things for you as to the ability that you have to grow. As in the ability that you have to develop these things. As in the ability that you have to build these things. If you don't have that ability, it doesn't matter how much inheritance is on you. God is not a waster. He's not a waster. You see, some people confuse God's abundance with the delusion to waste. See, even when he fed 5,000 men, the Bible says he asked them, what is remaining around? He tells them, collect all these things and put them together so they are not wasted. It wasn't in the mind of the people that were being fed. It wasn't in the mind of the people that were distributing this food when God had given food to the 5,000 people. But it was in the heart and in the mind of the child of God to make sure that that food is not wasted. So he's telling them, look, collect the fragments from wherever they are, that nothing be lost or wasted. Because it's not in the mind of God to waste because he has given you abundantly. And the wisdom to know the difference. So, back to what I was saying. It's reproach on a man's identity. It's reproach on a man's story. When a man's inheritance seems turned. And what does that mean? 
It doesn't mean that the people of this world take over what God has given us in Christ. It only means that they move in the graces that are supposed to be following them which have received an inheritance in Christ. And them which have received an inheritance in Christ stay on the lower stage of this narrative. And so before you know that, Christians are driving to unbelievers to beg for food. Christians are running to unbelievers for clothing, for help, for relief, for aid, to be succored. Some have sold their birthright to unbelievers. Why is she getting married to a man who is not born again? Yet she knows biblically it's not allowed. He has money. He bought her a very nice car. He built her a very nice house. And then she'll transact. If she had all these things, she might have not given in. You see? So there's many ways, and I'm, I'm not judging, but I'm explaining things that are happening in real life, real human life. These are things that are happening to us every day. Strangers are devouring of our own things. They are living in graces and glories that a child of God is supposed to live in. And we are not even sorry because in the inefficiency of certain believers because of their inability to explain why they are not winning in life, why they are not a success in life, they have formed doctrines around humanity, around the church that are sort of defining our piety with poverty. They are defining our qualifications before God because we are poor. And so, a couple of years ago, even in this nation, one of the first doctrines that were taught on this land, in the days of the first revivals in our nation, there was a certain righteousness that came with poverty. And so people celebrated that, you know, blessed are the poor. But they did not understand what poverty the Christ was talking about. There. He wasn't talking about physical. No, he was talking about spiritual, you see. But whether you wanted to note that there are shoulders of patriarchs and men before scripture of whom we have an accountability to, to do way better than they are because it's because of their graces, the graces that are operating on their lives that we have enjoyed the inheritances of the same. It's the power to make wealth, the Bible calls it, that it might establish the covenant that he made with your own fathers. Israel benefited from the righteousness that was given on Abraham, even before the doctrine of righteousness was clearly taught. But they all enjoyed of the righteousness. We are still receiving from the righteousness as the seed of Abraham because there are promises that he made to Abraham. And because of that, we easily connect to the grace that was operating on Abraham. But that righteousness was first imputed on that great man and it's passed on to the church as an inheritance. The sacrifices of David benefited as an inheritance to the church. The kingly anointing was clearly defined from the heart and order of the spirit. We are all, like I always say, as a result of old wombs. We are all carried by men who went before us. We are a collection of great graces, ancient anointings, and diverse testimonies. Things you will never be able to define. But as each word came falling as it was revealed to our patriarchs and men of old, the fathers and mothers that have gone ahead of us, great voices and distinctive anointings as they kept speaking certain things on the earth, these words went moving in the world and they sought to be fulfilled and manifesting in the lives of others. Some of the things that are in you, you will never be able to count them because they are so old. They are way older than you. They're even older than the existence of the world because God planned them and he hid them for your glory. And they are available to you. So these words that are being spoken, even the words that I'm speaking right now, not all people might be able to understand them in this time, but these are words that are coming from my spirit and they're being thrown in the air. And the Bible says that the word of God cannot be sent out and returned to him void. He says it must achieve that which he has sent it out to achieve. And he shall prosper in the thing with which he sends it, in which he sends it. So you see, yes, we're speaking words. These words are moving in the atmosphere. If you say, oh, I'm not going to receive these things, or if you don't connect to them, or if you don't tune in, it's your problem. They'll still move and find a certain man one day. If they don't come to your generation, they'll go to the generations below. If they don't go to the generations below, they'll go to third generations if they have to. But God's word does not return to him without accomplishing that which he has sent it out to achieve. It always returns back with an answer. And like I said, inheritance comes as a seed. It comes in the realm of seed. Hallelujah. And then he instructs you on how to translate this. On how to give it form and shape and definition 
That's when it starts to grow. That's when it starts to germinate. That's when it starts to multiply. That's when it's proved and demonstrated to the world. So, in the New Testament, if you are a believer, you're not even supposed to be fussing over an inheritance. It's available. It has been given to you in Christ Jesus. It is available. The Bible says, in whom we have an inheritance. We have an inheritance in Christ. It's undefiled. It does not fade away. It's available constantly for you. But how do you translate these things? How do you translate them? In the Bible, uh, there's very interesting stories given in the book of Exodus as the children of Israel are delivered from bondage in Egypt. And God is taking them through the wilderness into the promised land. The responsibility of God was more than just providing for these men and women in the wilderness as they were en route to the promised land. The biggest responsibility was changing a slavery mindset to a kingly mindset, to a national mindset, to grow and build their confidence again into a sovereign nation, to learn to become a people together with dreams and visions and aspirations of changing the world again when for hundreds of years they were slaves and building other men's visions. So yes, much as they are freed from captivity, but they still have a slavery mindset. And that's why they're asking for the onions and leeks and garlics. They're missing all that stuff. They would rather go back for them. That's freedom. And that's the space where things become so delusional in our understanding. And we start to seek for the things we're not even supposed to seek for because our mindset is tied to a certain darkness. To a certain darkness. When a man is in bondage for so long, their testimony is changed. And until reformation comes to the spirit of that man and that he might understand truly the mystery behind the things that are veiled, that man might never know how to truly pray. Or if he is to pray, he will pray as a blind man. He will pray as a blind man. He will pray as a blind man. One time I saw a video of a man who was born colorblind. So he could not design colors at all. And so... I've seen scientists have made these enchroma glasses where someone puts them on and they're colorblind and eventually the world comes to color. And so for the first time, they buy this man glasses that could correct that. And then somebody was capturing a video and this man puts these glasses on. And the first time he sees them, he weeps. And after weeping for about a minute, I think there was a wife in the background. She asks them, why are you crying, honey? And the man says, what I'm seeing is unbelievable. Is unbelievable. And I've seen people who have received sight for the first time, even in the ministry. The first thing that shocks them is what they see is unbelievable. They have a form, whether partial or full or color, they have a form because blindness forms a certain idea, a certain vision, and that defines your space of faith and what you are able to believe. When a man was born blind and you tell him that trees look like this, he will build his own vision on what he thinks trees are. If you tell him that cars look like this, he will build his own vision of what cars look like. If you tell him that flowers look like this, he will build his own vision about what he thinks flowers are. If you give him a vision of how his child looks like, he will only touch and he will take his own idea of what he can form in the abilities of his blindness to define that world. And so you see that he has a world full of everything that exists in the world and its elements, but he has his own vision about it. And for the first time, he receives the clearest sight, and what he sees becomes unbelievable. That means according to your level of vision, according to how and where you see in the world that you're in, defines your level of faith. Some people see the world in black and white. Some see the world in full color. The spirit realm is also like that for believers. Some believers see the spirit realm in full color. And some believers see blur images. They see black and white images. They see unclear images. How can you have faith when you don't see? It's not possible. You must see with a certain set of eyes. And that's the eyes of the spirit. So the Bible says that having not seen him, they love him. And they mean that they don't see him with their heart. Blessed are they that believe without seeing. He's saying that, yes, their physical sight might not be able to connect to the realities and the fullness of who Christ is, but their souls and their hearts see him. They behold him a certain way. 
So here he's talking about spiritual sight. There are people who are blind physically, but their spirit sees. And there are people who see full color physically, but their eyes of their spirit are blind. And for the Christian, the most integral part of vision is the spiritual. You must be able to see in full color spiritually. God has not called you to be one dimensional in sight. He has called you to be multi-dimensional in sight. Because that's the only way you can really believe God. It's the only way you can fully experience God in all dimensions. In all dimensions. So, the children of Israel are in the wilderness. He has delivered them by the hand of a mighty man, Moses. And they come from Egypt into the wilderness. But there's a journey. The journey is a promised land. God has booked the promised land as an inheritance for them. It's available. There's no doubt about it. It's available. So it's not even debated about whether they will get there or not. God has destined it for them to get there. He has appointed men, leaders, to lead them there. So it's God's mind. And as it is for God, he's preparing them. He's trying to give them a promised land mentality, an inheritance mentality. He's trying to awaken their consciousness to what he has given them. And so through the wilderness, we see also not only the journey of men walking with feet, but we also see instructions, the instructions of the Spirit, the instructions of God preparing them to enter the promised land or the inheritance. So in Exodus 23, the 27th verse, the Bible says that I will send my fear before thee. He's telling them what will happen as he's leading them there. And I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make all thine enemies turn their backs and to thee. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hevite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. And verses 29, he says, emphasize this, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year. He says, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. He says, but little by little I will drive them out from thee before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. Wow. Wow. So yes, the land is yours and I'll drive these people out. But I have conditions. There's a requirement of you being able to translate this land According to your ability, your resources, your wisdom, your potential, your tenacity, your increase and multiplication, according to how you're able to play this thing out. He says, it's yours, it's your inheritance. This is your inheritance. The land is your inheritance. But he says, but I will not drive your enemies out before thee in one year. I will extend the time. Because I have a fear. What if I drive all these guys away and take you into your inheritance? But he says, but you're not able to cultivate this land. The beasts of the field will multiply quicker than you are. And they will start tending and taking over properties while you're still in that land. And before you know that, you'll be overcome by the beasts of the land and the growing, the plants of the land. So he says, you know, I'm going to give it time. It says that I allow you to grow, I allow you to translate, I allow you to transform, I allow you to do whatever has to be done in this process of translation. It says that you are able enough to take over. So when I drive out these fellows, I know that you're going to take use of the place where you possess. And it says, instead of the speed at which I should have given this to you fully to manage, he says, I will little by little drive these people out before you until, now he has put it on the condition of your increase. Until you're able to build that tenacity. Until you're able to build the wisdom to run vast property. Until you're able to build the tenacity in your spirit. The potential is aligned and the graces are available for you to be able to to grow something out of there, to build something out of there, to develop something out of there. If you're not able to do that, then let me take my time in growing you until you are dealt with. So the enemies, even though are in lands that God has given to the children of Israel, God has to take his time to make sure that Israel grows into the maturity 
of taking over. Because if Israel does not grow into the maturity of taking over, it's useless for God to drive men out and leave lands desolate and beasts build there. Now he says, no, let's move at your speed. We're moving at the speed at which you are able to take over. We're moving at the speed at which you have applied yourself to the wisdom of God to know what to do with what I've given you. Somebody's praying, oh God, I'm tired of living single. I'm tired of being single. I break the spirits, those demonic spirits of my ancestral people, who, those curses that are following me. None of my sisters is married. I cancel. I break a new creation. A new creation. And they're going for overnight, casting out devils and doing all these things, fasting and sowing and being manipulated by, you know, all kinds of teachers and preachers because they are looking for a man. They are looking for a husband. They are looking for a wife a spouse. And God is saying, but woman, you are not yet a wife. And the Bible says, he that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. Not a woman, but a wife. He findeth a good thing and obtains favor before God. So what's the question? Are you lacking your met? Are you saying that God has not ordained a man for you in the world? He has ordained a man for you in the world. But that man is not looking for a woman. He's looking for a wife. The woman is a fallen nature. The wife is a more elevated nature. Because when we get into the conversation of marriage, it's more than just finding a woman. It is finding a wife. It's finding a wife. Let me show you a mystery. When Adam and Eve fell, the Bible is clear. That which fell was the woman, not Eve. In fact, after the fall, before Eve conceived to have children, you know what Adam did? He changed her name from woman to Eve, the mother of all the living. He placed life in the spaces of a fallen nature in this woman. That which fell came out of man. But that which becomes the mother of the nation is given an identity and a name of the living. The mother of all living, not dying. You see? So that's why Paul says he was a woman who was deceived and not man. So you cannot use that to say that all females are deceived. That all women are deceived. No, that's an old understanding. It's a very deceived understanding of how God works. But anyway, back to what I was trying to say. So you are struggling to get a husband, but you're not ready as a wife. And God says, uh-uh, he's available. But I want you a wife. Because he must find a wife. He must find a wife. And many other aspects, even in ministry, it's not that God doesn't open doors for us to do successful ministries. But you see, some of you or ministers are lasting for numbers, they are lasting for money, they are lasting for buildings, they are lasting for doors across the world. And God is saying, no. The issue is not what you are lasting for. All of that is available for you. But I'm trying to deal with you, man of God, in the character that you should carry as these doors open for you. So it doesn't mean that the doors are not available for you. But are you ready for what you're asking for? Are you prepared for what you're asking for? Has God dealt with you concerning what you're asking for? If you've not connected to this, you're wasting your time. You're not going to see that. You're not going to see that. People are not born CEOs of big organizations unless it's by inheritance. But there's a process of which men are worked into and they start growing up the ranks. If you just throw somebody in inheritance when they've not done that process, they're in trouble. That is why the Bible speaks of how certain inheritances unhastily do not end in blessing. Because God respects the process that makes the man, that qualifies that man to walk and move in what has already been given by God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the children of Israel now, he's saying, no, I'll drive these guys out. The issue is not the people that have to be driven out. My issue is you must increase in all aspects to the proportion of the spaces that you must take over in what I've given you. But if you're not ready, I would rather the stranger lives there. I would rather the stranger lives there. I would rather the man that is not in my covenant lives there. Because the point is, I don't want waste. I don't want desolation. It's not my nature 
to live in broken spaces. It's not my nature as God to live in places that are not tamed, that are not replenished. God loves to create a certain beauty, even in what he has given to you. And that is why when we talk about the slothful spirit, the spirit of a sluggard, why God has a problem. You know, the Bible speaks of how one time the man of wisdom walks and finds a man who was slothful and his vine was filled in the spaces where he should have, you know, dug to make wealth and food. It was all full of thistles and thorns and all of these ugly things. And the Bible says that this man received instruction from God. That's why the Bible says a little sleep and a little slumber and poverty will pounce on you. It's not really in the sleep that makes the man poor. No, it's the abandoning of the responsibilities that must grow you in the office God has called you already. That's where the challenge of these things are. The church is not teaching men the wisdom of translating things for the inheritance that is given them. And no wonder many are struggling, many are striving, many are fighting with things that they can never turn to manifestation, to demonstration, to proof and germination because they don't know how to translate what is given to them by God. I want to pray with you. My prayer for you is, is that you will receive the power, the wisdom to translate what has been given you as an inheritance in Christ Jesus. As an inheritance in Christ Jesus. That whatever you have in God and in Christ Jesus will be able to be proved, demonstrated, multiplied, to see it germinate as you learn the wisdom, as you connect to the power that makes these things germinate, that makes these things be demonstrated or proved. And that is the power of translation. Inheritance cannot be manifested without translation, without creating the form of those things, without giving the definitive interpretation and the mystery there is God's wisdom. The mystery there is God's wisdom. So I want to pray with you. But in prayer, that you will walk in that wisdom and power to translate. And if you do, everything that you've been given in God, in Christ, will be proved, demonstrated, will germinate, will manifest, will multiply before your eyes. And whoever is standing where you're supposed to stand, will give way by God. Whoever is sitting in the office you're supposed to sit will give way by God. Whoever is standing in places you're supposed to overtake will give way. And God says once you understand this mystery, it's the authority over the cities. It's the authority over your nation. It's the authority over your continent. It's the authority over the world. And that which plays in these things will become dark and dark as God illuminates you more and more for greater success. And if you understand this, the world will come to you. The world will come to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to raise your voice and speak to God. You take me. You mold me. You use me, you feel me, cause I give my life to the poor's head. You call me, you guide me. You lead me, you walk beside me, cause I gave my life to the porter's hand. You take Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you. Father, 
Zeri kabako sarala la bayerboza la baka. Rando robo zile boko shira baka talabayara baba. I speak upon you in the name of Jesus that may the wisdom to translate come upon you. May the power to translate come upon you. May the understanding to translate come upon you. May the knowledge to translate come upon you. May whatever God has given you, put for you, established for you, built for you, empowered for you, be aligned that by translation you will manifest, you will prove, you will administer, you will demonstrate, you will germinate, you will multiply, and that you'll have the fruit and manifestation of everything given to you in Christ Jesus. I decree and I declare that this is a wonderful year for you. This is a wonderful month for you. This is a wonderful period for you. Great things are happening for you. I decree and I declare that something just changed in your life and that it has changed for good and that you're going to produce the results of one that is not only called by God but blessed by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. May the things he has so prepared for you become so evidently manifested in your life as you enjoy the goodness of the living God. The sick are getting healed now because it's yours. Poverty is living your life. Bondage is living your life. Marriages are restored. Children are restored. Husbands and wives are restored. I thank you, Lord. Ministries are restored by understanding and revelation because you've been given the right way to pray. In the understanding you should pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed and believed. Amen. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to enter this kingdom, to be begotten to an inheritance amongst them that have been sanctified to share what we have as the saints in light Jesus shed his blood for you most importantly that you might have life you may have life and have it more abundantly it's more than just what you have now breathing in and out I'm talking about the light that is eternal that guarantees you immortality in Christ I want to invite you to that prayer and I want you to repeat these words after me wherever you are say Lord Jesus I thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory I believe that you are Lord and now you are mine take Lordship over my life I believe you changed me today I'm a new person. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.